I'm Eric Schoenfeld, co-editor of TechCrunch, and I'm here with Chris Dixon, co-founder of uh, Hunch and angel investor with uh, Founder Collective. So uh, you were just in the studio doing some founder stories, and uh, big news today, uh, a new complaint from Paul Seglia, who claims to own 50% of Facebook. Uh, and you know nobody knows this could be made up claims. Facebook saying that they were made up emails and made up uh, evidence. Um, but he has some pretty sort of compelling evidence in a, in a big law firm that it's taking his case. Uh, and if it's true, um, apparently I guess the story is that, you know, at some point uh, when Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg was 18 or 19, he did a work for hire for this guy Seglia for a, a, a site called, uh, a, a product called Street Facts for $1,000. And he talked him into paying another $1,000 to fund the, the very beginnings of the Facebook. He actually signed supposedly a contract giving 50% of the um, of the project to this guy, um, and the guy ended up putting another thousand dollars into it. And if it's true, this guy is probably the most successful tech investor of all time, right? Two thousand dollars for half of whatever Mark Zuckerberg's uh, shares are, uh, you know, ten million dollars maybe uh, worth of, uh, of of Facebook shares. I mean, you know, I'm sure that would be settled way before it ever gets to that. Um, but it raises a lot of questions about, you know, what should young founders and even just young programmers know before mm -hmm. they give away, uh, you know, sell half of their company for a thousand dollars. Yeah, and so I think, I mean, I think things like that. I have no particular knowledge of whether these claims are true or anything about that. But um, I, in my experience, these kinds of claims, especially whenever a company is successful, you have all sorts of people coming out and making claims, and and also when companies are acquired, it's very common for that to happen. Um, especially if people get wind that you're about to get acquired, because at that point, um, anyone making a claim has a lot of leverage. Because if you're in a very sort of, let's say, a delicate acquisition process, and somebody comes out with a big claim, that can that can scare off a potential acquirer. So I think there are um, certain just sort of um, imp basic things people can do in the beginning. Um, it's of course always easy to say in hindsight. You know, I'm sure when you're 19 in college, you're not thinking this stuff through. I think though that if you're serious about starting a company, um, it's very important first of all to have maybe some mentors around you who can guide you through this process. I think it's important um, if you're like some of the common mis to, to avoid there's certain common mistakes that are that are frequently made and good mentors will help you avoid those. For example, uh, one of them is in how you if you're at an existing employer, how you leave that employer and whether that be a contract, you know, for hire as it as, a, as allegedly in this case or if it's, you know, you're actually working at a Google or something. Um, you, you know, there's all sorts of rules around um, making sure that if you're thinking of new ideas, you're doing it on your own time, that you're not doing it at that office, that you're not using their equipment. Uh, it varies by state, so you should talk to a lawyer. I believe that California has what they're called honeymoon laws, which protect people who, as long as you're working on your own time, your ideas are your own. Um, you can also, if, if what you're doing um, can be alleged to be a trade secret, to like in other words, if you're doing something, you come out of Google and you have a new search engine, they can actually make, in some cases, even if you don't have a contract with them, actually criminal claims against people for uh, for theft of trade secrets. So you have to be really, really sensitive and careful around these things. Do um, Google employees have their own time, or is it all considered 20% time? I think it varies by state. I, I'm not sure, though. But that's my understanding is that, is that California has laws that say, that that prohibit any company from saying all of all, any all of any employee's time is theirs. These are called honeymoon right. laws. I think New York But doesn't. getting back to this case, I mean, it seems that the, the, the real pertinent uh, decision here was that you know this is complete speculation but you know I could see you know Zuckerberg is is you know young college student and he wants to get this project up and he's looking for you know money to just get the servers up yeah. and he sees this guy maybe he thinks he's suckering this guy or maybe you know maybe it's legitimate um, but he doesn't think too much of it, and he's like, "Yeah, sure, you can have half of." But this is exactly the why these problems happen. Because the beginning, you never think. Because the beginning, you're just sort of like, "Yeah, I have this little project. It's a side thing." Right. You never think it's that important, which is exactly when people get sloppy, um, and that's why later, you know, and then later on, something's worth a lot, and it's those sloppy beginning moments. So, what's the rule of thumb? Let's say you have a situation where you're a uh, you're an engineer, and you're gonna you're gonna build the pro the product. It's a software, you know, uh, or hardware product, and you go to somebody who's gonna fork up the money, um, and this is just for the initial prototype. How much should that person, uh, the, the investor, 
you know, what get for for the money that they're putting up. Well, that's the val I mean, that's the valuation, effectively, right? Mm -hmm. A valuation effectively says um, if you value something at a five million at a million dollar valuation, and they give you half a million dollars, that's you know that then they get a third of the company or whatever the math works out to be, right? So that should be a negotiation, and just to know to even have a sense of what you might be worth. That's a that's a good time. If you if you're if you're about to devote your life to something, that's a good time to find people who are experienced with this stuff, and that could be either a, an experienced entrepreneur or investor. Uh, 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 one of the sort of five main startup law firms can do a good job here in making setting things up very cleanly. These are people like Gunderson, Wilson, Sonsini, etc. I highly recommend using those law firms. They understand these sorts of issues, these specific issues, which other a lot of other law firms aren't familiar with. I've gone through. I've actually tried to use other law firms to save money, and found it to be a mistake. Um, you can often find these people often do it for they'll often defer their fees um, till till you get financed so it's not actually a financial issue in the beginning um, and it really like I, I'm the last person in the world to say just like to want to wanna spend money on lawyers but at that beginning phase there's just I, there's so many times I've seen this happen where, where like I've been an investor in a company they're about to sell and like five people come out with claims um, and and at that point you're at your weakest point because you know you don't want to mess things up with the acquire or let's say you right. go public or anything else um, you see situations all the time with the so-called forgotten founders which is which is uh, uh, you know a, a, a third person who was working on the project maybe they were promised some equity maybe some um, twins <laughs> yeah, the, um, I mean these aren't the all this but, isn't but, the only person but it's who's not come out yeah from, but it's also like besides just the, these sorts of like not having a bunch of standardized contracts for example there's something like every every startup should have founder vesting which means that if a founder leaves early mm -hmm. they forfeit you know a, a significant portion of their foregoing future equity you'd be shocked mm -hmm. how often people don't have that I used to work in venture capital. I'd see a lot of cap tables, meaning the ownership structures of companies. And I would say almost a third of the time, there was a person who owned something like 20% who left three weeks later, you know, uh, since founding. I mean, Some it's guy amazing. named Fred. And you yeah, asked, it's amazingly who's, who's common. This guy Fred? That's exactly right. right. And it's amazingly common. And, the, and I know law firms in New York who startups use who actually recommend no founder vesting. These are not the good startup law firms. I mean, like, it's amazing that, like, there are, that th these things happen and there are people who should know better who give this bad advice. Um, you right, because in the beginning, you, you're three friends. Yeah, you're drinking beers, you're having fun, right. you know, whatever. It's like, you know, you think it's you're just a pie-in-the-sky thing. I mean, who knows if it's really going to be something big. And who knows who's going to contribute the most, right? Yeah, so you're like, you get 30%, you, and, you know, then you think, and, and people, t a lot of people give bad advice. They think vesting is actually a way to protect you from your investors. Like, in other words, I don't want vesting. I want my stock today, because right. what if the investor fires me? But in real life, what, hap what tends to happen empirically much more often is one of the founders quits. And not the investors fire, and that founder quits, and then keeps a lot of their equity. As an example, right? So it's really important to to think about all this in the first six yeah, months. Yeah, or, or get or just find somebody who knows, understand. It's mm -hmm. not that much work. Like I sold a company before, and when you sell a company, you're asked they, they what they do. It's every anyone who does is when you sell a company, if you IPO, whatever the exit quote unquote might be, you, you will a, a big law firm will come and spend four hundred thousand dollars. Like the acquirer will do it, or the IPO people, whatever, and they will say to you. Uh, some person, uh, you know, you spoke to four years ago, uh, came in and fixed a router. Do you have an invention assignment agreement with that person? Like this stuff will come back to haunt you, and it's better just to be clean from the start. And there's just some fairly straightforward best practices you can follow that will protect you from a lot of these issues. Uh, and, and it just, you know, if I if I could just sort of <laughs> say one, that's sort of the one message I'd like to get across is that I think I think there are a lot of law firms, for example, who will do it for free. There are there are, right. there are friendly advisors who will give this advice for free. I, you know, I think one of the good things about these sort of incubator programs like y, y Combinator is I think they give people really good advice about these things. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I think this incident in particular is going to really open up a lot of people's eyes. And you know, the uh, the lesson, the takeaway I, I get from this is. Don't sell your company, half a company for a thousand dollars. I mean, this is also, you know, expect. success as a thousand fathers and failures an orphan. I mean, you know, so it's also like, I mean, it's probably, you know, I, I bet you every successful company has had a, had these sorts of situations come out, and you know, you're protected to the degree to the degree you you were really clean in your initial right. legal documents. But I think this is probably par for the course for a lot of big things. It's just, yeah. It's okay. Just, well, thanks for uh, giving us all sure. your advice. Yeah, no problem. And we'll see where uh, where this lawsuit goes.